And just a few announcements uh, before the homily today. Um, first, uh, you notice perhaps coming in on the table that our, our 2020 offering envelopes are, are available. Um, for many of you, uh, you already have them, and that's great. I know a number of you have chosen to uh, make your regular offering monthly uh, through our website online, which is great too, and that's a, a, a big help for the parish. It cuts down on our workload and it makes things a lot easier. Um, if your envelopes are there, please pick them up. If they're, if they're not there, or if you don't have envelopes and would like a hard envelope to bring with you each Sunday, uh, please just fill out one of the blue forms and, uh, and, and that will give all your information and we can prepare a box for you uh, for the coming weeks. If you have an envelope, spot, an envelope box, I'm telling people, the higher the number, the more you're supposed to give, right? So this year we're going for really big numbers. Also, uh, there is two other uh, offering opportunities. Uh, uh, on the last pew, after the last pew on the left going out, uh, one of these sheets, a white one, has uh, for the Sunday missiles. Um, I guess that's more, sorry, that's more for the English Mass people. We don't, we're not using those. Um, but the, the green one, anyway, is for our Christmas uh, decorations, for to have the real Christmas tree, and also for the flowers and stuff for Christmas. If you see the green one and want to take one to make an offering for the decorations, um, in memory of a loved one or just uh, as it is, you can, you can do that. Just fill it out and bring it back and put it in the collection basket. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, today we celebrate both the second Sunday of Advent as we're continuing on this journey towards the birth of Jesus. And also today, kind of a unique thing in the church calendar for this year, we celebrate also the Immaculate Conception of Mary on this December the 8th. Notice that this day is exactly, eight, or is exactly nine months before the birthday of Mary, September the 8th. Our teaching around the Immaculate Conception is that our Blessed Lady was preserved from contracting original sin, which all of us do just by default when we are born. But she was preserved. She was saved by, by Jesus even before her birth. Um, and... Uh, and, and then she lived her, her life, uh, her whole life, free from sin. Whereas Eve failed and acted in disobedience and led Adam to do the same, Our Lady Mary, her yes resounds. Her yes to God, her yes to a life full of grace resounds. And she never gave in to sin. In the readings today, we hear, especially in the first reading from Proverbs, we hear of this reflection upon wisdom. And even we give to Our Lady the title, Our Lady's Seat of Wisdom, because she is, a, she is a, a wisdom figure. And it speaks about how even as the world was being formed, God had, the church is hinting by putting this reading today, God has Our Lady in mind. That even right from the very beginning, he intended to create Mary. He intended her to be this beautiful, um, wise, pure, humble, faithful woman. And what a grace we have when we read in the story how, uh, how uh, the angel Gabriel comes later on and announces those words, full of grace, as we hear in the gospel. Ave Maria, Gratia plena, full of grace. I was uh, searching around just that word, full of grace. And one of the better, uh, easier explanations of what that means was just in, in a YouTube video put together by a priest from the Institute of St. Philip Neri, and you can search for it and find it. And there he points out to sharing what does this term, full of grace, really mean? And he says, if you look into the Greek and into the grammar, and I'm not going to do that. Some of you are maybe really interested in that. Um, it's amazing, anyway, the conclusions that he comes to. You can look him up and see how he gets there. But these are the conclusions that he says that, that properly in the Greek, in the English, maybe it's unclear what it means. Nowhere else does it say exactly full of grace like it does to Mary, the angel Gabriel, to Mary here. 
Sometimes it's translated just highly favored one, but it means something really deep. So what he comes to the conclusion of, the way that it's worded, the grammar, how everything works in Greek with those words, that by saying a gratia plena, full of grace in the Greek, what it's saying is, uh, is in grace is not just that Mary has lots of grace, like maybe she has super abundance of grace, but that she is completely filled with grace. Like her, her whole being, so much so that it's, it's, it's her identity. Her identity, it's almost like God is giving her a name. She is grace. She is grace. She's so full and, and filled with grace that, that, that this is who she is at her deepest level. It is her identity. And then he goes on even further to say the way that it's worded, um, that, uh, that Our Lady has been, as the angel Gabriel comes, has been filled with grace, not just now when the angel comes and the Holy Spirit overshadows her, but it's very clear from the way that it's written that she was already full of grace by this point, that she had already been totally filled. And for us, that fits exactly in line with our teaching that, that Our Lady, be, even before then, had been full of grace. Even from the moment of her conception, right from the very beginning, Jesus saved her, and, uh, uh, and, and preserved her from original sin and then from all sin. But there's more. Not only was Our Lady from the very first moment, as indicated in, this, in, this, uh, in these words, full of grace, but even he says that the grammar points to um, that this meaning something more into the future. It's not just something in the past and it's done and it's set, but it's something that is relevant in the present moment as it's being recorded by St. Luke. In the way that he's writing it, this is relevant right now and, and forever. The, uh, the, the Immaculate Conception and Our Lady being gratia plena, being full of grace. What relevance does it have for us here today, this solemnity of the Immaculate Conception? I just want to briefly point out two things that bring about the relevance and the importance of Our Lady immaculately conceived and persevering in that state forever. For us, we need that example of our Blessed Lady. For us, as we're struggling through in this world, it's good for us, really good and important, that we know, that we know that there's a better life. We know there's a better way to live. We know that, that darkness has not fully overcome the light. But Our Lady shines as an example to us of what our human nature was made for, of how it, of, of, uh, that it was made for God. And each of us, we can know God. We can be close to God. We can be filled with grace. We can live better. We can be holy and faithful. We can be saints. We do not have to be defined by our sins or by our weaknesses, but with God's help, all things are possible. If we're willing to work and to struggle, to strive, if we're up for the challenge, with God's help, it's possible. We see how Eve lost so much, right? Mary is, uh, is like, she is the new Eve. Eve lost so much when she was disobedient to God and led Adam to do the same. And uh, for Our Lady, she shows us. She calls us back. Remember the beginning. Remember how you were made. Remember Genesis. Remember how God walked in the garden with you. How he was so close. You're made in his image and likeness. She's a living reminder to us of who we are called to be. And that's one of the reasons why I think we need Our Lady. We need the Immaculate Conception. And then as well, we also see in Our Lady her yes. We need her yes to God. When we think about her, we think, what was the secret to her greatness? Why, like in all of our churches, we have images of Mary, of our Blessed Mother. Why is it? It's because like she's so, she did so much on her own. She's so smart. She's so beautiful on her own. She's uh, accomplished so much by working really hard. She is all of those things, right? But, but, but everything is rooted in God. All of her strength comes from her yes to God because she followed the will of God. 
All of her beauty comes because she reflects God in her faithfulness. Everything for her comes from her faith and her yes to God. When she says at the Annunciation, yes, to the angel Gabriel, this isn't something new for her. It's something she's been doing her entire life. And it is another yes along the way. A big one, but just another one along the way. For us, we need that yes of Mary to inspire and to encourage us also in our lives every day to strive to say yes to the will of God, knowing that if we do this, we will be great. Maybe not great in the eyes of many people, who cares? But we will be great in the eyes of God because we will be faithful to him. And the path that he has set for us, the opportunities, the, um, the things that he wants us to do and accomplish for, for his glory, we will be able to do. We will have all the strength and power to do it because it all comes from him. Our Lady, full of grace, you who were overflowing with grace, your grace which became your identity at your immaculate conception, your, uh, your grace, your full of grace that happened at, right from the beginning and is relevant even to the present moment. Help us, we pray. Inspire us in our hearts to strive to be like you. Help us to trust God like you trust him. Help us to be faithful like you are faithful. Give us your purity. Give us your strength. Give us, pray for us, that we can be full of grace. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.